Uh, hi everyone and welcome to my second presentation here on my YouTube channel. And uh, this one is not overall my first presentation here, but uh, it's my first one to be held in English. And so I hope I won't mess things up too much. So here I'm presenting a piece of work I had to prepare for a course about the prehistoric art of East Asia. The task assigned was to introduce the archaeological site of Sansingdui, which is a Bronze Age site in Sichuan province, China. It's a picture glossary intended to show what is so special and noteworthy about this site, so I'm focusing on anthropomorphic or human-like sculptures, heads and masks made of bronze and their distinctive features. So we will start off with the structure of the presentation, which shows the five parts that make up the whole thing. Uh, the introduction will give us an all-round insight into the site before I tend to the artifacts themselves. I will just read out the introductory texts for you. The archaeological site of Sansingdui is roughly placed at the center of Sichuan province, about 40 kilometers northeast of the provincial capital of Chengdu, in the area of the prefectural level city of Deyang. It belongs to the Shu culture, which uh, was an independent local culture in Sichuan. The site contains an abundance of artifacts, which range from the Neolithic times to the Bronze Age and were dated from 2800 to 800 before the Common Era. To Japanese, which are generally referred to as the sacrificial, sacrificial pits, um, take a special role in these findings. Basically, it's two pits which have a north-south orientation and are positioned within a settlement that was partly walled, partly surrounded by water streams as a nat natural border. The two pits uh, are only about 30 meters apart. They are designated as sacrificial sacrificial pit number one and number two and were dated to the 13th to 12th century before the common era according to their contents. Sacrificial pit number one measures 4.5 by 3.5 meters at the shaft opening and 4 by 3 meters at the bottom of the 1.5 meter deep pit. It contained uh, ceramic vessels, stone or jade tools and weapons, amber 13 elephant tusks, about 200 bronze objects like vessels, head sculptures, halberd blades and rings, four objects made of gold, several dozen cowrie shells, and three cubic meters of burnt animal bones, wood and bamboo. Sacrificial pit number two is narrow. It measures 2 by 5 meters and 1.5 meters in depth. It conten its contents are much richer and consists of, consist of uh, 67 elephant tusks, 4,600 cowrie shells and several hundred, hundred bronze objects that are partly gilded. The excavation record counts as much as 1,300 fragments of bronze objects. Both pits have been sealed with rammed earth. In both pits, the objects were deposited in layers according to their respective types or materials. Both do have three distinctive layers. The objects in both pits were damaged prior to their deposition. Furthermore, the objects in two pits are distinctive in material and kind of damage inflicted on them. While in sacrificial pit number one, ceramic vessels and burnt animal bones were found and the head sculptures were more naturalistic, sacrificial pit number two contains no traces of burnt organic material and the figural depiction in bronze sculptures includes mythological beings, trees and birds. Although the objects in sacrificial pit number one were more likely to be damaged by fire than by shattering, 
um, while objects in sacrificial pit number two were more likely to be shattered and scorching damage was less common. Uh, thus, the pits are thought to be constructed as a part, as part of two similar kinds of rituals, which were conducted some time apart, and thus reflecting the different stages of social and economic development of the settling. As mentioned before, there are different layers in the pits. Here you can see the second layer of sacrificial pit number two. Now let's tend to the artifacts. First I want to show you two anthropomorphic sculptures. I uh, chose those mainly because they are regularly published and thus can be seen as representative works to give an insight into this topic. Among the best known findings is for, an, for example a tall bronze figure of a man wearing uh, ceremonial robes uh, standing on a socket. It will be the second entry here. The data given, uh, the data is given on the upper or lower left and comprises size and categorization and artifact type. Everything is given in three languages: German, English, and Chinese with pinyin. Uh, same goes for the details I pointed out on um, on the artifacts shown in the charts, since uh, this presentation was originally meant to be a picture glossary. Um, to keep it well comprehensible and make the distinctive features well conceivable, uh, most are marked in two or three charts and on different objects throughout this presentation. The first artifact shown belongs to the category of sculptures. Today only the top half remains, leaving the rest of the lower body and the legs missing. The part preserved is about uh, 43 centimeters high. Um, the first thing to strike one's eye is the odd headgear it's wearing. Uh, it has long protrusions on its top, which can be interpreted as, elephant snout, as an elephant snout and stylized elephant ears or at least some kind of animal ears. Elephant, uh, elephants and a cult worshipping those elephants uh, is believed to have played an important role in the shoe culture. A typical problem with interpreting findings of the shoe culture is that it was an illiterate culture unlike the Shang and the Zhou cultures of the Central Plains, rendering an understanding of the shoe culture a difficult task. Yet there were trade contacts as seen in some of the artifacts recovered which clearly show central plane influence and um, there were written sources dating to the Eastern Zhou period dealing with the Shu. However, these written sources uh, have to be handled with caution since they were written much later than the actual actual culture's existence and thus contain a whole lot of false or at least imprecise informations. So um, here this headgear uh, has a bigger hole in the front with uh, small holes at its rim. It is assumed to have held something Yet uh, nobody's really sure what that was. It may have been feathers, fern or palm leaves, or painted wood or bamboo ornaments, or even incense. Uh, in addition, the typical facial features, which we will encounter in various quite similar forms in the other bronzes, can be seen here. This drawing shows the dragon pattern that appears quite often. I will show it on detail later. More important here is the sun wheel pattern. In uh, sacrificial pit number two, a five spoke sun wheel has been found. Uh, it was shortly visible as I showed the second layer of pit number two. Um, and thus it's also believed that there was some kind of sun worship. But of course we lack of proof of that too. The second sculpture I want to show is the well-known tall standing figure of a man in ceremonial garb. Uh, it most likely depicts uh, either something like a priest or shaman, 
uh, but could also be some kind of king or chieftain. It stands 2.6 meters tall, with the figure itself making up um, 1.8 meters. So compared with the average sizes today, it's an ordinary height, but uh, it's considered to be more than life-sized compared to the people of that time. The two arms stretched forward and the big, big hands uh, are very striking. They most likely held something like round bowls or containers, or even elephant tusks, which would fit uh, the hands positioning very well. Assuming that is indeed not too far-fetched, as the closer look at the decorative socket will show us soon. But first, let's have a detailed view on the figure's upper back, so to say its uh, shoulders and head. Um, here you can see small rectangular openings at the back of the head and uh, between the shoulder blades. Maybe these were places to fit in feathers or textiles too. It's also well possible that there was a holder made of bronze at the back of the figure's head because something similar had been found in a head retrieved from the pits. The term dragon pattern has occurred twice already, indicating the surface pattern of the figure's garb, and so I decided to add a drawing of the pattern with, um, uh, which decorates the mantle. Obviously, the dragon depicted here is very different from the Kuei dragon or beaked dragons seen on the bronzes of the Shang and Zhou. This dragon bears a crest on either its snout and its back. In addition, it has well-developed limbs, making it appear far less snake-like uh, than the dragon depictions of the mainland. This is even more emphasized by the big fist-shaped hands and feet. If we take a closer look on the socket, we can see um, more clues hinting at the importance of elephants and culture and rights of the Shu people. The decorative part of the socket is made up of four elephant heads facing to the socket's four corners, standing on their snouts. The tusks are also clearly visible. Uh, the part called a forehead attire here may as well be inter interpreted as the animal's ears being crafted a bit oddly, since it wasn't fitting otherwise technically. Uh, next we will tend to the bronze heads, which are divided into subgroups, the first one being those with a flat head. The typical facial features are clearly visible in this object and make it easy to distinguish and easy to remember even on first sight. The big, edgy and outsticking ears do have one or two ear piercings in most cases. The next head is an example for the second group of heads, the round heads. I've put only a few descriptions here, but I wanted to show the fitting for the head attire here, which um, may have been mounted at the big standing figure's head's back as well. Um, I don't have the back view here, but uh, those openings are facing upwards and downwards. So overall it looks like an hourglass or a tube with uh, widened openings at each side. In addition to the green patina, which is also visible on the ritual bronzes, a bronzes of the Shang Zhou can be seen here. There are also scorching damages having a different appearing. The development of patina is caused by oxidation and carboxylation uh, of the copper in the alloy. It's either a rough cover layer, turquoise or uh, greenish in color, or shows up as heavy incrustations in different shades of green. Scorching damages, on the other hand, are um, rough and coarse and have brownish coloration. Uh, some heads are also shown as wearing masks, as this one shows. Uh, I've just put it in here to show the overall variability of the heads uncovered. Apart from uh, the masks, this uh, from the mask, this is just another example for the round heads. Another category, um, though round-headed as well, is represented in this head: heads wearing head attire. 
Um, this group is overall relatively small, but nonetheless mentionable. Um, this piece is especially qualified as representative of the group because it shows another characteristic of the Shu pe people or the Shu culture, and that is that they wore braided pigtails. Most of the hats with uh, head attire do wear something like a headband or a circumferential ring or band, but this one has a braided pigtail. Um, depictions of these are also seen in a great many of the other hats, where they are represented as a surface pattern um, in the neck running downward. Um, this hat was found in pit number one and uh, thus is believed to be a bit older. This may be seen in the connecting zone as well, which is quite sloppily cast. Um, this hat has uh, three ear piercings per side. The heavy incrustations of the patina, which uh, clearly differ in color, are also very well visible. These uh, incrustations are called efflorescences. Gold crafting is also a special feature of the Sansing Dui side and the Shu culture. A handful of heads and masks were covered with leaf gold, which is more or less preserved in, on many objects. It seems like surface decorations or different contrasting colors played a, role, uh, played a strong role in Sansing Dui. Um, not only gold has been found, but also rests and traces of vermilion for the lips and suit or ash to uh, highlight eyes and eyebrows were found on many masks and hats. Um, the contrasting colors were striking and seemed to be used extensively. They, uh, I've also marked um, the socket in this example. Um, it's uh, safe to assume the hats were not just uh, put or deposited somewhere, but rather fastened or something uh, to something. Mm, wooden poles are likely candidates, but regarding this tall standing figure, uh, it's also well possible that figures or bodies have been made from organic materials like wood or bamboo to house the hats. Mm, those bodies could be clad into clothes or painted to prepare them for whatever kind of rituals. However, this would of course be true for uh, wooden poles as well. I mean, you could um, prepare them however you wish to have them pre uh, prepared as well. You don't need to prepare some wooden body. Okay, um, also a very well-known type of artifact um, of the site are masks. Um, there are very big monumental masks like this one, masks that are average sized and small plain masks. Uh, in all three cases I find it difficult to really call the mask because uh, those as big as this one here are just too heavy and that's um, impossible to put on. It's uh, more probable they were fitted on um, rather big tree trunks or even on a building as part of an architectural decoration. The big um, cut fitting holes make that assumption pretty believable. Uh, not only is the mask big, is uh, the mask big, but uh, also the eyes or to be more precise the pupils. Um, those protruding pupils um, are very characteristic for Sansing Dui and can be seen on the second monumental mask as well. Again, we can only guess what the meaning of those uh, pupils was. It seems like uh, the eye w also played an important role in the cult somehow. Mm, the eye taking a special role in uh, religion and beliefs is well known in other parts of the world as well. In uh, Egypt, the Eye of Re or Eye of Ra uh, was worshipped, and in Japan, the Sun and the Moon deities Amaterasu and Tsukiyomi were born, while Izanagi, one of the two primordial gods, um, washed the dirt and corruption of the underworld from his eyes. 
Uh, maybe the mask is uh, meant to show the mythological ancestor of the Shu people. Um, he's known from written sources of the Warring States period and is described as having a few su superhuman and animal-like features. Mm, these animal-like features uh, may well be represented by those Darwin's points on the ears. It's a uh, typical atavism, so to say, a setback in evolution that shows up quite often in us humans up to this day. Um, it's kind of a reminder to the pointy ears of our monkey ancestors. Um, same things are visible in this monumental mask. Again, the eyes, or more precisely the pupils, are protruding and stick out of the face, and this mask has Darwin's points too. Um, yet there's a big difference, as you can see in the gigantic ornament on the nose that could hardly be some kind of garment. Uh, it rather resembles an elephant's snout, like the one seen on the uh, headdress of the first sculpture, and could be interpreted as connected with the elephant cult somehow. Uh, also, the dra dragon pattern application adorning the snout is very interesting, as it shows this particular motive even here. Uh, this mask is uh, relatively normal in its dimensions and uh, could thus really have been used as an actual mask. However, the lack of eye slits or holes um, is still not fitting the interpretation of this object as a mask. Maybe uh, a special area or stage has been prepared for strictly organized or choreographed um, rituals or dances to move blindly, uh, so moving blindly wouldn't pose much of a problem. In uh, religious Taoism, for example, there are some rituals in which its uh, participant have to walk across the area according to strict rules where every step is meticulously planned and exercised. Uh, this is also possible when wearing a mask without eye slits, as long as a big enough area is prepared. The last piece is representative for the last category of masks, the animal shape masks. Um, the facial features are very different from what we've seen so far in the mask and hats and in the masks and hats and sculptures. Okay. Um, the eyes are not worked out plastically, but flat. The eyebrows are joined with the elemental decorational part of the um, pattern reaching over both of the creature's horns. The ears look quite different and are more close in style to the dragon patterns seen before. Since the whole mask is completely flat and lacks uh, eye slits, as uh, all the other ones, it's most likely not really a mask, given the fact that there are two small holes where the horns and the head meet, and also at the corners of the jaws or chin, it's far more probable that it was a plaque attached firmly to um, clothes by sewing them onto the surface, or that it was bound only loosely and could be attached and detached when required. Uh, finally, in this example, the application of coloring agent is clearly, agents is clearly visible here. According to the sources I used, uh, coloring, coloring was regularly employed on the bronzes and is often remaining up to this day. But uh, these are seldomly visible on the photographs, so I couldn't show those vermilion and suit um, which uh, are still visible on many of the pieces when you see them close up. Um, that's why I've chosen this mask to repre represent the animal shaped masks, because uh, here we can see one of those features that are also very important and distinctive for the Sansindui side, the use of colors as a means of decoration. 
Okay, and the last chart lists the sources I used, and as you can see, the sources are marked with the same cryptic symbols you could see during the presentation, which were at the uh, lower right, um, rendering those um, symbols not too cryptic after all. They just uh, show the sources we have taken the pictures from. Okay, and that's it for now, and I hope... Um, yeah, this was uh, quite interesting and fruitful for you, and I hope I will be feeling like making another presentation in English sometime. Okay, thanks.